we're going to talk about the service of documents, and the service of documents becomes important if you ever have to prove that you served a document, a letter, or something on someone. If you're simply writing an email to the property manager asking a question or the board asking them a question, and you're not contemplating any form of lawsuit or litigation, and you really don't care about the service of it, and you don't really care that you may, it may take a week or two to get an answer, then this doesn't really apply here. The service of documents becomes important if you need to prove that you've served people, owners or the corporation directly, uh, with the particular document you are serving as Hugh rightly pointed out on the issue of rules. So typically, uh, the best way of, of serving someone with something, with a document, is personal service. Hand-to-hand, -hand, served on the date it was given. So if you serve someone personally on that day, that is the date of service. So if you're starting a lawsuit, obviously there's time limits in terms of responding to a statement of claim or a civil claim, and as a result, uh, that's when the clock would start, when you personally serve someone. And of course, the corporation can be personally served at the address for service that is on the CADS, which is the condominium additional document sheet, and typically it's the property management company, and if it's self-managed, then obviously an address of someone would be on the CADS. And of course, an individual board member can also be served on be on, for the corporation. Another way of serving the corporation or an individual is recorded mail or what people would typically call registered mail where you send it and wait for the person to sign the document. Ordinary mail is another way where you just put it in the mailbox and service there is deemed to have occurred seven days after mailing. So if you mail it today, service of that document will, will be deemed to have been served in seven days, one week later. And then, of course, electronic mail by email where you can do so by, uh, and services deemed to be uh, within 24 hours. Now, the next slide, please. Now, under the changes that were made in the regulations, and you'll see on the slide there, specifically section 73.51, an owner can request that documents be served electronically and the corporation must provide them electronically. And the, an owner must provide an email address or some other uh, electronic address that is permitted by the regulations, bylaw, or the board approval. And service then is effected within 24 hours after service. So boards, given the fact that uh, email is now available to you, not telex or fax, but email, uh, then boards should probably be looking at creating some form of consent document in which an owner would sign and fill out to confirm that they want documents to be served electronically. And the board should also uh, pass a resolution identifying the electronic consent form as a method of service. And that can be done at the board level as well. I don't want to spend too much time on, on the service of documents other than the fact that, again, this becomes relevant if you need to start calculating the time in which a document was served on someone. And typically, that becomes relevant with the passing of the rules, with, uh, with the start of a lawsuit. Those become relevant in that regard. As of July 1st, uh, there are two types, and this became effective July 1st, 2019, there are two types of general meetings that are available to condominium corporations. The annual general meeting, and through the efforts of CCI, Hugh Willis, Todd Shipley, and many others, there have been some major changes as a result of the regulations in terms of annual general meeting. And of course, special general meetings, or what we also hear people call them extraordinary general meetings, the same thing. Boards can also call, and, and of course this was available to boards even before all of these changes, but boards can call information meetings 
with owners, to provide information to owners. The neat thing about information meetings, you don't have to worry about quorum. No motions can be made at this meeting. So if only four people show up and it's an information meeting, that's wonderful. Have your information meeting. But there's no need for any quorum calculations because there won't be any voting or any direction given to the board. As, as I indicated, as a result of the efforts of CCI, Hugh Willis, Todd Shipley, and many others in terms of the improvements from what we got uh, back in 2019 and to what we have today, they, the government removed that preliminary 60-day notice requirement. So you don't have to do that anymore. Give people notice 60 days in advance of the AGM saying, oh, by the way, we're having an AGM. But, but keep in mind, if you have the default bylaws, that rule is there. So if your corporation relies on the default budget, you'll have to do the preliminary 60-day notice. Under the, if you don't have the default budget uh, bylaws, then of course this doesn't apply. The other thing too, owner's agenda items. No longer can owners force a board to place an item on the agenda. That's been removed. But if you have the default budget, uh, bylaws, that's still there. Voting rules are, are under review. Electronic voting has also been removed. And of course, I believe, and I think, uh, and when we get to the Q&A, I believe that if an owner has a legitimate issue to be placed on the agenda, put it on the agenda. You don't need regulations to tell you what is right for the corporation or not. In terms of notices uh, for meetings, no less than 14 days prior to the AGM. Ensure that the AGM package has the annual financial statements. You'd be surprised how many corporations don't do that and just hand them out at the meeting. The reserve fund study uh, annual report should be in there and the current annual budget should also form part of the package as well. This is something new and I like it, that within 60 days after the AGM, the corporation must provide all owners with a draft copy of the minutes from the AGM. Now typically what happens now is that you won't see the draft minutes until the next AGM. And so a year or so has passed since the last AGM and many people will have forgotten what was said or done at the AGM. And so the approval of those minutes or the debate of those minutes, people are going on memory. So the neat thing, again, they don't, they're obviously not approved minutes, but they're the draft minutes. So people can have them within two months of the, of the AGM. The other thing which I think is really neat is that the, any ordinary resolution passed at the AGM, the results of the vote must be in the minutes. So you have to be calculating that vote. Any special resolution passed at an AGM, of course the number of persons in favor and the number of unit factors that they represent and the number of people against that motion as well. So the, mo the, the minutes have to be a little more fulsome than what I've seen some corporations have done. And the other thing which is a significant change is that with respect to the board election, the number of votes cast in favor of all of the candidates must be listed in the minutes. So remember, after every AGM, most people will put up their hands, pass, uh, move a motion to destroy the, the ballot. So people don't know how many, how many votes people got. Well, that doesn't matter anymore. You will now know how many votes people got winning and losing. So it doesn't say just the, the, the people who were successful, it means all of the people who were part of the uh, ballot for voting. Form 8 is the document that has to be filed uh, after the board has been elected. The, the, I, I really like this change that board members no longer have to provide their home address on the Form 8. The Form 8 is a document that is filed at land title that lists all of the board members who have been elected to the board. Your name appears on the list, including your home address. This change now no longer requires board members to list their home address. They can list the address of the property manager. And if the board is served with a document, 
individual board members are served with the document and the address for service for those board members is the property management company, then the property management company must accept that service of that document. The board, property manager can, cannot say, oh no, Charlie Brown doesn't work here. You've got to go find Charlie Brown, the board president, and serve him personally. But if Charlie Brown's address is the property management company, the property management company will say, thank you, we'll, we'll make sure that Charlie Brown gets it. And that form must be filed within 30 days of the AGM. And of course, any change that occurs on the board during that time must be, uh, must be filed at land titles. The board can convene a special meeting or an extraordinary general meeting at any time. So if there is a special need that the board thinks that the owners need to hear and we need some direction from the owners, they can call an extraordinary general meeting any time. Or the board must call an extraordinary general meeting or a special meeting within 30 days after receiving a request in writing from persons entitled to vote representing only 1,500 unit factors. The threshold is extremely low so that if, uh, if at least 1,500 unit factors come together out of the possible 10,000 in your condominium, because every condominium corporation in Alberta has 10,000 unit factors, if 15% of those come forward and say, we want an extraordinary general meeting because we want to discuss A, B, and C, the board must call that meeting within 30 days. The other changes or improvements in the legislation deal with proxy requirements. The proxy is simply an opportunity as an owner who cannot attend a meeting to give my power of vote to someone else. That's, the, that's, the, that's what a proxy is. The proxy must be in an electronic format or hard copy and contain at least the following key elements. Number one, the name, signature, and unit number of the owner, the name of the proxy holder, and the date the proxy was signed. So if I, as an owner, want to give my voting power to Charlie Brown because I will be away that night, I better make sure that I put my name, my signature, and my unit number on that document. I must indicate that I'm giving my proxy to Charlie Brown and the date that the proxy was signed. Now what is clear and I, I, is that it doesn't say that my proxy holder has to be an owner in that building. Charlie Brown can be my partner, I'm away, Charlie Brown is coming to the meeting on my behalf. They need not be an owner within that building. But as long as I meet the requirements of the proxy, you will accept Charlie Brown as, as my proxy holder. Now the bylaws and any rules that you talked about can set out the requirements in terms of use, verification, and registration of proxies. So if you don't know Charlie Brown, but he has my proxy, you better make sure you get a piece of ID to verify that Charlie Brown is in fact uh, the, the proper person holding my proxy. Now there are certain restrictions that the government has put in place with respect to proxies. I can limit and place restrictions on Charlie Brown or instructions on Charlie Brown on how to use my proxy. So as an owner, I can say to Charlie Brown, vote yes all the time. And Charlie Brown will be forced to vote yes all the time. Charlie Brown cannot use any discretion at all. I can say to Charlie Brown, I've looked at the agenda and you are only allowed to vote on items two and four of the agenda. This proxy is limited to voting on items two and four only. The rest, you, you have no voting power at all. You cannot no longer give your proxy to the property manager to vote on your behalf. The only thing you can do is give your proxy to, a vote, to the property manager to count for quorum. That's it. The property, and this is a good change. The property manager should not be involved in the voting of any corporation. They should be seen and act independent of any of the issues that come up at the AGM or any special meeting. All proxies that are used must be certified before the meeting. So someone receiving the proxy when they come into the meeting should look at it and go, yes, that's valid and we, we will allow you to use the proxy. When there are multiple proxies that are presented 
for the same unit at that meeting, the one that is dated most recently to the date of the meeting will be the one to be valid. And the proxy, of course, is expires six months from the date that it was issued or any time earlier when an or owner decides that the proxy is no longer valid. In terms of best practices, again, if you don't want to do it by bylaw, I think it would be perfectly legitimate to do it by rule. And you can set out the proxy form. You could develop your own proxy form that owners can use so that you have one form that it's consistent, that has all of the requirements, and all they need to do is fill it in. The registration of proxies in terms of where they should be sent, any deadlines so that the board is aware of who has a proxy, the verification process, how you will verify that the person coming to you that night is in fact the rightful person to hold that proxy. You may want to consider using photo ID, of course, of any proxy holder at the time of registration and ensure that the owner's name on the proxy, in fact, matches that of the title. 